All right, let's get started. Welcome. Thank you for coming to Audubon Great Lakes webinar, Bitterns, Herons, and Rails, oh my, marsh bird stories from the Great Lakes. My name is Stephanie Bilkey, and I'm the Conservation Science Manager for Audubon Great Lakes, and I will be your facilitator for tonight's presentation with the help of Aaron Rowan, our Conservation Associate, as well as Isabella Grabelna, our Chapter Network Associate, and Kristen Murphy, our Government Affairs Associate. Thank you so much for taking the time to learn more about secretive marsh birds with us today. We want to know, have you ever come face to face with a mysterious bird called a Sora and thought maybe you landed in the wonderful world of Oz? Well, many of these lesser known creatures with names like least bittern and night heron actually live and breed right here in our Great Lakes coastal wetlands as well as interior wetlands. And many of them even might be in some of our backyards here in the Great Lakes re region. So um, next slide. Tonight we'll be unlocking the mystery behind these secretive birds to learn more about how they can how we can help protect their uh, freshwater resources in the Great Lakes. For the first half of our webinar we'll be introducing you to some of our favorite marsh birds and then Join us for the second half where we invite special guests to share their favorite marsh bird encounters from across the Great Lakes. We hope that today's stories give you, into, give you a peek into the lives of some very special birds. Next slide. A few housekeeping items before we get started. I just want to point out that if you're new to Zoom, um, Zoom meeting, um, just there, you can see uh, where the participants and chat functions are in Zoom platform, which are at the bottom of the screen. And if you'd like to send a question or comment, please use the chat box. If you're joining us from Facebook Live, you can also submit questions or comments in the, the comment section. And if you're joining by phone, you can also email us your question and you can email that directly to me, Stephanie, dot bilkey at audubon.org. So that's S-T-E-P-H-A-N-I-E dot B-E-I-L-K-E -E at A-U-D-U-B-O-N dot org. We'll take questions at the very end of today's presentation. Uh, during the Q&A, you also have the ability to answer or ask questions verbally. And to do that, please use the, the blue raise hand button to digitally raise your hand and we'll unmute you um, when it's time for your question. Next slide. The webinar is organized by Audubon Great Lakes, which is a regional office of the National Audubon Society. And um, we work across the Great Lakes watershed with five states and chapters in Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Ohio, and Wisconsin. And our work also spreads across the other Great Lakes states, um, Minnesota, Pennsylvania, and New York. We hope that our webinars can help promote connection across where we work and beyond, serving our chapter members and the greater public by engaging them in our bird conservation projects. Next slide. Next, I will introduce Erin Rowan, who is a conservation associate with Audubon Great Lakes. And Erin is going to be kicking off our presentation on marsh birds this evening. And Erin will be telling us about why marsh birds are important, how we're helping to protect them. And um, during uh, this presentation, she'll also be joined by co-presenters Libby Keys and Matt Beatty. So take it away, Erin. Great, thanks so much, Stephanie. Um, so today's webinar is all about marsh birds, but before we dive into our favorite species, I wanted to go over briefly why we care so much about these decorative birds. Uh, next slide, please. At Audubon, one of our top conservation goals is to protect these, uh, well, to protect these birds, but also protect the health of crucial water resources for birds and people. Audubon's Great Lakes Initiative uses marsh birds as important environmental indicators that tell us about the health of our coastal wetlands. Our wetlands are the interface between our local waterways or drinking water sources and the Great Lakes. So by monitoring these mysterious wetland birds, we can actually help direct our conservation efforts to where they're needed the most. We work with our partners to restore marshes, 
increase populations of marsh birds, and benefit local communities by providing high quality wetlands that filter our water. Next slide. I'd like to now introduce Libby Keyes, our marsh bird volunteer coordinator, who's going to tell us more about these secretive birds. Libby, take it away. All right, thanks, Erin. Uh, so let's, um, oh, next slide. Um, so let's meet our cast of characters, our secretive marsh birds. So I'm gonna introduce some of our focal species. Uh, we have a few more species that we like to watch out for and record as well as we're doing these surveys. Um, but the ones we're gonna talk about today are the ones that are really critical for our surveys for a couple of reasons. Um, so one, these species are generally declining throughout their ranges in North America, and that's due to things like habitat loss. And a lot of these species are classified as state threatened or endangered in Indiana as well. They're also what we call secretive marsh birds. So your typical methods of surveying, great for other birds, don't typically um, pick up these birds during surveys. So that means that without using the types of surveys that we're using, uh, which we'll talk about a little later, we didn't have a very good idea of how these species were doing in Indiana, what their numbers were like, what sites they were using, and that meant we didn't have a good idea of how wetland management was affecting these populations. And finally, they're really good indicator species. So an indicator species is one that reflects the quality of an environment. So essentially, these guys are really, really picky. So if we have a wetland site that doesn't have any of these focal species present, um, that might indicate to us that something isn't quite right for them. And that could be water quality or water levels or vegetation. Uh, but if we have a lot of these species, um, especially if we record more over time as we're restoring the environment, um, that shows us that we're moving in the right direction. So let's meet some of our birds. Next slide. All right, our first focal species is the least bittern. So this is the smallest bittern species in North America. It's smaller than even a green heron. They're small and they're light enough to hang on to reeds over water. They're only about four ounces, so super light. And they're sometimes referred to as the squirrel of the marsh because of the way they can move between reeds and jump between branches to fish in the water from above. They're super, super secretive and hard to spot. And we usually hear their cooing call without ever seeing them. They have a pretty cool loud call for such a small bird. So next focal species. <laughs> there we go. So our next focal species is also a bittern, but it's the much larger American bittern. Um, so notice with these guys how well camouflaged they are. They're very streaky brown and white, and they're really well known for striking this classic pose with their face straight upwards, and it exposes that really striped throat so they blend in with the reeds around them. I mean, they have this really fantastically weird, strange call that's earned them all kinds of nicknames, like the thunder pumper and the water belcher. Uh, so let's give that a listen. Not a call you'd think would be coming from a bird, right? Um, and next slide. This next species is the black crowned night heron. These guys usually nest in really massive colonies, although we don't usually see large groups in our area anymore. Um, and although they're called night herons, they're actually pretty active during the day as well. Uh, this is a really, really widespread species. They can be found on five of the seven continents. So if you've ever been on vacation in another country and you've seen a bird that looks like this, it's very possible that you did see a black crowned night heron. Um, and they have kind of a squawking call. Pretty similar to a lot of other herons. So our next focal species. 
is the Sora, typical rail species. So this guy is a very small chicken-like marsh bird. It has a bright yellow bill and a black mask, a very Halloween of them. And although they're the most abundant rail in North America, they're very, very secretive. So we're way more likely to hear one of their whinny calls than we are to see these guys. They're pretty cool to hear out in the wild. All right, so our next uh, focal species, it's another secret of rail species. <laughs> and it's the Virginia rail. So these guys use that really long bill to probe in the mud for food. And like many other rail species, they have this very thin compressed body and these super long toes. And that helps them move around between dense reeds. And that's where we get that phrase, thin as a rail. Um, these guys have a really funny call. It's super, super loud, and it sounds a bit like a pig grunting call that they use to defend their territories in the breeding season. All right, and then our final focal species. Uh, this, oh. <laughs> the pied bill grebe. So this is the tiny expert diver. They can dive so fast and silently that they've earned nicknames like the hell diver or the water witch. And for such a tiny little bird, these guys are like half the size of a mallard. They have this really, really loud echoing whooping call. All right, so that was an introduction to some of our very, very secretive marsh birds. Um, and I'm going to pass it back over to Erin so she can tell us a little bit more about why these birds are in so much trouble. <laughs> The real birds do that too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much. I loved hearing the water belcher nickname for the American. <laughs> it's got to be my all-time favorite. Um, so yeah, to kind of dive back into why these birds aren't doing so well, um, due to human activity in the Great Lakes region, we've actually lost about two-thirds of our coastal wetlands to conversion to agriculture, industry, or development of human residences. Our remaining wetlands are extremely valuable, but they're also still under threat from invasive species, habitat degradation, and the continued expansion of development. Like we mentioned, birds are excellent bioindicators of habitat quality. They're the proverbial canary in the coal mine, uh, and marsh birds are telling us that wetlands loss and degradation are preventing them from thriving. Next slide. So we're gonna share the data from Birds Canada's Great Lakes Marsh Monitoring Program. And it's showing us that between 1995 and 2018, many of our secretive marsh bird focal species and secondary species have faced steep declines. Um, pink lines here indicate trends of steep annual declines. And for these first two species, black terns and common gallinules, they've seen annual declines as high as four and a half to just under 5% each year. Next slide. Yellow lines on this slide for American bittern and swamp sparrow represent stable populations and green represents increasing populations. So while some birds are starting to stabilize or increase in recent years, this gives us hope, um, but many of our marsh birds are still in trouble. So what are we doing to help? Libby, can you let us know more about how we're working together to help these marsh birds? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm gonna talk about our surveying process. Um, so we have this uh, huge range of volunteers. Um, next slide, unless it's sticking. Um, 
And our volunteers are surveying secretive marsh birds uh, so we know how well they're doing in wetlands across the Great Lakes. And our volunteers are super dedicated and incredible. Our surveys start a half an hour before sunrise to capture as much marsh bird activity as possible. So they get up super early to, to survey these sites and get our really important data. Um, now, if you've ever um, participated in a bird survey or you know what they're like, um, things like the Christmas bird count or um, breeding bird counts, you'll know that the basic idea of a bird survey is to um, count all the birds you see and hear in a time period. Um, but our surveys have a little twist on them and that's because our target bird species are so secretive. So if we waited to see or hear them, we would probably hardly record any and our surveys wouldn't be very accurate. So we have to use things called playbacks. Next slide. So normally, uh, playing calls, especially during the breeding season, isn't recommended. So a lot of people, um, if there's a lot of people at a site that are playing, say, Virginia rail calls, uh, then those real Virginia rails, they'll spend a ton of extra time and energy trying to find um, and guard their territory against this imaginary new Virginia rail. Um, and a lot of times they might end up leaving the site. So for our surveys, we're only playing these calls for less than 30 seconds during our three survey periods across a month and a half. Um, so we're not causing any extra stress for these birds, but we're getting the really good responses that we need to record these birds and get really good data. So you can see one of our, um, our data sheets here. So our playbacks are these special recordings that are 11 minutes long. They start with five minutes of silence, and then we broadcast the calls of some of our focal species that we met earlier. And then we also have a set of secondary focal species that we look out for as well. Um, and when we hear a response, or if we're really lucky, we see the focal species that we're looking for, uh, we record all types of data about it. Um, like the minute that we heard it, the type of call, if that species has different calls, the distance and direction that we heard it come from, and along with all the data that we take at each point, things like temperature and wind and noise levels and water levels, we've been able to create this really useful data set that shows us how these populations are doing and how they're responding to management in these sites. Um, and I'm gonna pass back over to Erin and she can tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, thanks Libby. On next slide. So Audubon Great Lakes, trying to give a little bit of background context on where we're collecting a lot of this data too, um, work together with National Audubon Science Team to create a spatial prioritization map doing an analysis looking at these different factors that could impact wetland and water quality. Things like nitrogen and sulfur in surface water, invasive species presence and absence, and presence and absence of our target focal species. So we could target our wetlands restoration and marsh bird conservation efforts where they're needed most. Next slide. And these 11 priority zones are where the bulk of our coastal wetlands conservation work is being done across the region, um, as well as our marsh bird monitoring work. Next slide. You can interact with this priority map, by the way, at the link in the chat. See what your local hotspots are. Um, Audubon Great Lakes works directly with land managers and partners to improve habitat through restoration, native plantings, invasive species removal, and installation of water level control structures at sites within these zones. And marsh bird monitoring is often done in conjunction with this work. Next slide. So this way we can determine, like Libby was saying, how birds are responding to the management as well as inform land managers on which management techniques are most effective. Uh, this red zone is a, a spot in Michigan. We're hoping to do some wetlands enhancement work and then we'll be conducting marsh bird surveys within both the red management zone and the green control zone where there's no management um, taking place. So now we're gonna hear from the land manager's perspective by talking to a land manager. Uh, we have Matt Beatty joining us, who's a restoration crew member with the Nature Conservancy. Matt, can you tell us a little bit about what the Nature Conservancy has learned from marsh bird monitoring data and how your organization is responding? Yeah, thanks, Aaron. Um, so we work in the far Northwest corner of Indiana. Um, it was one of those priority areas on the map you just showed. Um, and areas along the Grand Calumet River which is, uh, you can go on to the next slide um, on the left side of this picture that's coming up. 
um, and these are in the communities of Gary, Hammond, and East Chicago, Indiana. Our project is focused on restoring um, high quality remnant dune and swale habitats um, that are made up of a mix of black oak savanna uh, and prairie on the dune ridges, sedge meadow and emergent marsh in the wetland swales, and all of this embedded in a very urban and industrial landscape. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little, uh, about a kind of unique way that the marsh bird monitoring has impacted our management. Um, these natural areas include some of the most biodiverse habitats in the whole state of Indiana. And because of this, we have a very diverse set of conservation targets. And these include rare and protected plants, insects, and other animals. Um, I'll talk about a few here in a second. So four years ago, Audubon Great Lakes started doing marsh bird surveys. They expanded the marsh bird monitoring program into Northwest Indiana. Um, you'll hear later on in this pro presentation from Walter. He was the monitor for DuPont Natural Area and continues to monitor that site, which is pictured here. Um, the monitoring program allowed us to focus on one of our conservation targets, secretive marsh birds, with a level of detail that we didn't really have the ability to do before. Um, and it quickly revealed, even just within the first couple years of monitoring, revealed two big things. Um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so the first thing is it showed us that the marshes in these natural areas in the Calumet region, uh, particularly places like DuPont um, in, in this picture on the left, um, ranked among the best sites in the whole Chicago region for marsh bird diversity. Um, all the focal species mentioned earlier by Libby um, were found in these marshes. And then two, uh, the marsh birds were, it showed us that the marsh birds were often relying on stands of the invasive hybrid cattail for nesting habitat. Um, and this posed a pretty significant management dilemma. Um, so on, uh, hybrid cattail is a hybrid between the native broadleaf cattail and the invasive narrowleaf cattail. Um, it's a very aggressive wetland invader in the Chicago region, and it poses a very serious threat, um, perhaps second only to Phragmites, to a lot of our conservation targets, particularly in our wetlands. I included photos on the right of two examples of these conservation targets, uh, spotted turtle um, uh, above and a black dash skipper below. Um, partly I included them just as an excuse to put a butterfly photo in a bird presentation, but also because they're great examples of rare and declining species that are found in our project area and that are directly threatened by the invasive hybrid cattail. So this, di this dilemma that the marsh bird monitoring program was showing us was basically a matter of trying to balance the needs of different conservation targets. On the one hand, how do we protect our diverse sedge meadow and native marsh habitats from the invasive hybrid cattail, but to do so in a way that doesn't destroy in the short term the nesting habitat for the rails and bitterns and other marsh birds. Um, these birds will use other native vegetation like hard stem bulrush that has been slowly dis uh, displaced by the hybrid cattail. But these plants, at least on our sites, have shown to be fairly slow to recolonize, especially the deeper marsh areas that have been cleared of that cattail. The marsh bird monitoring program was showing us that there was a real risk that we would inadvertently eliminate marsh bird habitat if we continued to aggressively manage hybrid cattail infestations across the entirety of our sites. You can go to the uh, next slide. So the, the good thing is that by highlighting this dilemma, the marsh bird monitoring program has allowed us to chart a path forward to find a solution and see a future where marsh birds and spotted turtles can both thrive in these Calumet marshes. So we've started out uh, mapping areas where we, we're gonna leave large stands of cattail for the marsh birds to nest in, in a way that allows us to manage it and keep it out of the sedge meadow habitats where it poses a threat to so many of our conservation targets. Um, we've also increased efforts to jumpstart and uh, uh, encourage native emergent marsh vegetation. We're growing plugs and planting stands of that hard stem bulrush so that we can try to facilitate the transition between um, getting away from the hybrid cattails that we're, that we're managing for and or managing and uh, over the long term. So the great thing about this story for me, I think, is that it's an example of a community science pro monitoring project. Um, a lot of times, you know, you have to have faith that the data you're collecting in these um, community science monitoring projects will be used for something later on. But this is an example where it's really directly influenced land management in the short term, which I think is pretty inspiring. Um, so I'm going to pass it back to Aaron now to talk more about how people can further help these marsh birds in their wetland habitats. Thanks, Matt, so much. And yeah, it's such an interesting case that you're, you're encountering over there with your marsh birds. We're seeing something similar at some of our black turn sites as well. 
Um, so yeah, like Matt mentioned, if you're wondering how you can help our marsh birds, uh, you can become a marsh bird monitor. We're looking for volunteers um, for marsh bird monitoring in the Chicago area, as well as Ottawa County, Michigan, St. Clair Flats, Michigan, Rochester, New York, and Buffalo, New York. Uh, volunteer recruitment will begin early next year, but in the meantime, you can email me directly for more information. Uh, if you want to learn more about some of our statewide survey efforts, you can check the links in the chat box or get my email address there as well. Um, for those on the phone, my email address is erin.rowan at audubon.org, and that is E-R-I-N dot R-O-W-A-N at A-U-D-U-B-O-N dot org. Another way that you can help our marsh birds is by supporting the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, um, which is a federal funding program that supports Great Lakes coastal wetlands restoration and now marsh bird conservation projects in the region. This funding also goes towards projects which aim to make fish safe to eat, water safe to drink, and water safe for recreating, um, control and removal of invasive species, and delisting of areas of concern. Audubon Great Lakes is currently working to get GLRI, or Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, that acronym, funding increased, and got a bill passed in the House um, and are now working to get it passed in the Senate. So if you're interested in being kept in the loop on that bill, you can sign up to receive action alerts at the link in the chat. The action plan, um, the GLRI action plan, directs how those funds are going to be spent, um, and that gets updated every five years. So that process just occurred last year, and Audubon Great Lakes submitted formal comments on the document and encouraged the inclusion of marsh birds as a primary species. With the help of our Audubon chapters and members, all six public meetings were attended and Audubon represented, um, and informed comments were made on the document. So this as a result of all of this hard work coming together, uh, for the first time, the plan will specifically seek to benefit breeding marsh birds through collaborative conservation and monitoring at local and regional scales. So that's a big win for marsh birds uh, for us moving forward in the next five years. Next slide. Another way you can support our marsh birds to support climate change and sustainable energy legislation at the local and federal level. Um, Audubon's recent climate report that came out last fall showed us that two-thirds of North American bird species are at risk of extinction due to climate change. But it also showed us that if we take action now, we can help improve the chances of 76% of those species at risk. Next slide. And this one's animated, so you can click two more times also. Um, this graph shows the number of water birds and marsh birds that are low, medium, and high climate threatened within the Mississippi Flyway. So this is showing us that only about one third of our marsh birds and water birds are expected to remain stable in the Great Lakes region. Next slide. And the final way you can support our local marsh birds in the Great Lakes is to also support the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. This bill was passed over 100 years ago now with bipartisan support and the help of Audubon advocates and other early conservationists to carry out international migratory bird treaties with several countries. This act protects nearly all of our uh, country's migratory bird species, including our migratory water birds and marsh birds, and has helped bring snowy egrets, wood ducks, and sandhill cranes back from the brink of extinction. The current administration announced a new interpretation of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act that would allow for unregulated take by industrial activities. And you can learn more about the act's history and how you can get more involved in supporting the Migratory Bird Protection Act at the link in the chat. With that, I'll pass things back over to Stephanie. Thank you so much, Erin. And thanks Libby and Matt too. I know that was probably a lot of information that we just discussed, but don't worry for those of you that registered for this webinar, we'll follow up with more details and links from that we've been sharing in the chat. So um, for the next half of the webinar, we are going to be bringing in our panel of marsh bird uh, monitors and biologists. And our panel today includes Allison Gillett, Brad Bumgarner, Tom Kerr, Vera Leopold and Walter Marsis. Everyone who has been lucky enough to encounter a secretive marsh bird has a story. So today we're asking our panelists, what is your marsh bird story? So first off, I'm going to introduce Brad Bumgarner. 
And Brad leads our drone survey data collection for Audubon's Marshbird Monitoring Program in Indiana. And drone surveys are helping us to better understand the habitat that marsh birds need to thrive across the state of Indiana. Brad Bumgarner is the Executive Director for the Indiana Audubon Society and chairs the annual Indiana Dunes Birding Festival. So Brad, um, can you tell us about an interesting en encounter that you had with a marsh bird while conducting drone surveys? Absolutely. Yeah, thanks for, uh, for having me here uh, this evening because I really had this unique opportunity to be able to connect the, the data that uh, volunteers are taking out in the ground and, and literally get the, the bird's eye view. Uh, as you're looking at a lot of these wetland habitats, you can look at images such as like on Google Earth and, and you're going to see a, a snapshot of what that wetland might look like in terms of where the open water is, where is the density of vegetation, but you really don't see it in real time as the birds are seeing it in the spring. So the drone surveys that we do really help to kind of connect that and, and give you a real snapshot in time of what those wetlands look like. And so what I do is I travel around the state and I'm able to get uh, images of what these wetlands uh, look like at each of these survey points. And, at every survey point that our volunteers are going for the 11 minute surveys, I'm actually out there for anywhere from 30 to 40 minutes. So once that drone is flying in the air and it's collecting that data, there's, there's not a whole lot I can do, but just kind of enjoy the scenery and sit back and relax. And so it's a, it's a great opportunity to see a lot of the birds that are visiting these sites and, and to have some cool interactions. And, and just to kind of see what it looks like when we're flying over, if we go to the next slide, you'll see one of the, uh, the images that, that we might to, uh, take. In fact, uh, that image right there, if you can find it in a, a Where's Waldo of photos, but uh, I believe there's both a, a great egret and a great blue heron that was uh, in that image. So you have shallow water and you can see where some of the cattails or other vegetation are. And imagine taking a, a site where we're researching for the birds and collect a hundred of those uh, with overlapping photos, stitch them together, and that's sort of what you get uh, in this really large kind of high definition uh, image of uh, what these wetlands look like as the birds are flying by. And as, as I'm sitting out there, uh, one of the, the neat opportunities I've had is uh, to do a lot of surveys in both the Northwest Indiana area. And in Northwest Indiana, uh, we're dealing with uh, uh, a lot of different variables as well, in addition to the weather conditions near Lake Michigan, but things such as uh, Gary Airport or power lines in the area that we have to kind of manipulate around to collect that imagery. Down in Southern Indiana, we have a lot of sites that are much more remote. One of my favorites to go to is the Goose Pond Fish and Wildlife Area. And for those that have been down there, it's a you know, great birding opportunity, a uh, fairly new property in the last uh, decade or so. And, and there's uh, some really great neat spots. You can see a lot of these secretive marsh birds. And, and I had one particular uh, evening where I was running uh, some drone surveys pretty late. You know, a lot of these sites take 20, 30 minutes. And, and it was about 30 minutes before sunset. And I was all wrapped up. And I thought, you know, let's just kind of hang out and uh, see what I can hear. And, uh, and I was kind of walking around the, the main point after I put the drone away. And, and I certainly heard uh, the real loud kicker call of a, the king rail. And I was like, oh my gosh, the king rail. You don't get to see or hear these very often. So I had a, ran across about a, a hundred feet away and, and I was looking for it. And then I, then I heard the sound behind me. I was like, wait a second, there's a second king rail. So then I ran back uh, across the road. And this is a, if you've been to Goose Pond, what they call the double ditches area right along the highway. And, and I ran across there and suddenly I see that there's these king rails coming out of the wetland into the grass near a parking area. And, uh, and I was just enamored with it. And I thought I'd get down really low and just kind of watch them. And they started to, to feed out in the lawn. And I noticed they were kind of doing this long path. And the next thing I know is, is, is as I'm laying down, they're not even noticing me and they kind of get behind me. And so I sort of get in position to, to take, uh, to at least what I knew of, at least no one that I've ever seen has taken a, a king rail selfie. And if you go to the next slide, you'll, you'll kind of get a quick little image of what that was. And so as I was laid in the grass there, the, the pair of king rails actually passed right behind me. And I snapped a couple quick pictures as they, they kind of scooted across there when they got in the opening. So I don't know how many people have actually gotten a chance to, to get a king rail selfie uh, compared to all the other different wildlife species that you might get an encounter with. And, uh, and I can tell you that by the end of the day, uh, it was well worth the 43 ticks I think I got uh, that evening laying down there in the grass for it. But uh, so that's just one story that, that I've had while out in the field uh, doing some of these different drone surveys. Thanks so much for sharing your story, Brad. I, I think you must be the only person who has taken a selfie with a king rail. <laughs> that is hilarious and Memorable. awesome. And also reminds me that I really have to get back to Goose Pond. I've only been there once in the winter, which is also a really great time to go because it's just 
filled with ducks and sandhill cranes, like thousands. So it's a, it's a really cool place to visit in um, central southern Indiana. Yes, it is. All right, so next up, I'm going to be introducing Allison Gillett, who is also based in Indiana and is our main in, uh, partner in our Indiana Marsh Bird Survey. Allison is the ornithologist for the Indiana Department of Natural Resources, and Allison has worked with a variety of birds from red-winged blackbirds to Galapagos hawks, and is excited to, and honored to conserve birds in Indiana for many years to come. Allison, would you be able to share a story about one of your interesting encounters during marsh bird monitoring? Absolutely. So the thing about um, the marsh bird monitoring survey is that uh, it forces you to wake up really early in the morning, sometimes four o'clock in the morning, five o'clock in the morning, especially after, if you have to drive an hour. And so it's completely dark. Um, if you could go to the next slide, this is pretty much what it looks like when you're walking out to be able to conduct your first survey. Um, and it's supposed to be about half an hour before sunrise, but you still have to get to your point. And so all my wildlife encounters have been at Goose Pond, um, just like Brad was talking about and Stephanie was talking about. This is a great place, a great wetland restoration in Southern Indiana, near Linton, Indiana. And it is um, just brimming with wildlife. I kind of think of it as a very magical place to be. Um, the, the moon was really beautiful that morning, and as I was walking out on the levee to get to my first point, um, I was just walking along, you know, doing my own thing and not expecting anything to happen. You know, and, and it was totally dark. I had my hand lamp, and as I was going, I heard something in the grass, and it just kept scurrying along. It was just kind of like a rustle in the grass, and then it kept getting closer and closer and closer. And then all of a sudden, if you go to the next slide, there's this big tail that just pops up and waves itself around like a big flag that said, hello, <laughs> I'm right here. <laughs> Do not get any closer to me. Um, so I have an irrational fear of skunks. <laughs> uh, just the idea of getting sprayed by a skunk just totally seems unpleasant. I know I hear a lot about dogs that get sprayed. They seem totally fine. But for a person to get sprayed for uh, it seems to, it'll probably last for quite some time, but um, these guys are pretty, even though they're about the size of a cat, uh, their tails are pretty um, uh, intimidating, I'd say. So I saw this big flag just showing up, big fluffy tail, and it started, it stopped dead in the water, pretty much. I stopped dead in the water, and it decided, hey, okay, I'm going to stand my ground. So I had to go around the skunk to get to my point. I had to get to my point because I didn't want to wake up again in the morning. I'm not a morning person. So um, I was like, I'm definitely going to get to it. So I gave him, my, gave him my room and he just kind of kept going the same direction. Once he realized that I was not going to in any way cause a risk to that, the, the individual, he just kept going along, moseying along. And we went our both like our separate ways and everything was great. So that was my first terrifying wildlife encounter, but it turned out really well. And that's the one thing I really enjoy about the Marsh Bird Surveys is that it gives you this unique opportunity to be able to experience wildlife, even not just birds, but in a, a very unique way. Um, that, that's but then so I true. have another Marsh Bird Survey. Mm -hmm. Oh, so, one person just asked where you were surveying. So I was surveying at Goose Pond Fish and Wildlife Area, um, and it was kind of like in the upper northwest area of Goose Pond. Um, I can't, it's just, they're all divided up by wetland units, but I can't specifically remember the wetland units. Thanks. Yeah, you can go ahead with your, your next story. Sure. So the, the next story I have actually deals with marsh birds. If you go to the next slide, um, this one was specifically a very exciting experience because I had never actually seen a marsh bird in my life before, and this was when I actually just started uh, as the ornithologist in Indiana. It was about a year into what um, into my job, and I was kind of getting a little broken in to uh, understand what the marsh bird survey was all about. So I went with my assistant Amy Kearns, and she was installing 
all of our points, we have stakes that indicate the point at which the, um, where the survey point is. And so she was out, uh, we were walking along the levee and she was out separate from me about maybe I'd say like 300 meters away trying to install this stake. And all of a sudden I was just standing on the levee waiting for her, just kind of hanging out. And then all of a sudden out of this grassy area, this thing shows up. And it was like, I looked at it, and I had never done a marsh bird survey before, but we were setting up for the marsh bird survey, so it was related, related for sure. And it popped out, and I'm like, I think I know what that is. I think that's the king rail, but I need Amy to come here and confirm this, but she was super far out right there. And I was just like, uh, what do I do? I can't get a picture of it. It's way too far away. Um, but luckily this bird was full of hormones and was just out in the open, hanging out, foraging. Um, so 10 minutes later, after Amy was done installing it, I jumped up and down and was like, it's still here. It's still here. You have to come and see this thing. <laughs> and she's like, I want to see it. And she came, she rushed back and she's like, that's a kick rail. <laughs> That's amazing. And then, yeah, that was like one of the most exciting moments of, of my, my, my job, I'd say, um, was that moment. So after that, I had another marsh bird experience. Um, it was, uh, next slide, it was when I was covering for somebody else who could not do his, his points because he was busy that week. Um, and instead, um, it was at the first point when I was uh, covering for him, it was totally dusk, uh, or rather dawn, and I just walked up from the parking lot on the levee, and then between some cattails, this head pops out in between the cattails, and it was a least bitter, and I never thought they were that small. They really do live up to their name. They're almost like, I would say, the size of your hand. Um, very, very tiny. They live up to their least, that's all I have to say. And this one just stuck its head out, and I froze. I tried to take a picture because it was probably around four feet away from me, but it was very um, skittish. And so I kind of decided, okay, I can't reach for my phone. This is not going to be worth it. I'll just enjoy the moment as it is. So that was my last really significant marsh bird experience. Um, so the thing about the marsh bird survey, I'd say, um, next slide, is that even though you don't necessarily always have these experiences, like really unique wildlife encounters. Um, the best part, I'd say for every survey that I do is just to see the sunrise. So I really enjoyed the surveys for sure. Thank you, Allison, so much for sharing your stories with us. It's so exciting. Thank I you. have never seen, my only look at a king rail was just like reeds rustling and we heard it and that was it. So maybe someday. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. All right, so next we are going to introduce Tom Kerr with um, Buffalo Audubon Society. And Tom is the naturalist with Buffalo Audubon Society. And Tom, you have some stories to share from Marsh Bird Monitoring out in New York as well. Would you like to tell us your story? Sure. So um, this story actually comes um, from before I worked for Buffalo Audubon, I was a New York City urban park ranger. And I worked in a salt marsh in Brooklyn. And one day, when I was still pretty new, and still pretty new at birds and birding, someone brought us a bird cage with a Virginia rail in it. And they, they found it like, like in downtown Brooklyn and didn't know what, what it was. And then they, they thought for a while they'd keep it. Um, there was a piece of string tied around its legs. So when they gave it to us, we took it. We cut the string off and, I, and I'm just holding this teeny tiny, you see them and they don't seem so small, but they're tiny. And, I'm, and I take that and let it go into the marsh. And that was my first for seeing a Virginia rail. And they've really been one of my favorites since. Um, I, I feel like anytime I see one is just like, I'm so lucky because they're so secretive. They're, they're so, they're not common. Um, they're so habitat specific. You got to really be in the right place at the right time. Um, but if I'm ever leading a tour and I see one, or if I'm 
if I'm even lucky enough to, to be on, leading a tour and see chicks of Virginia rails, it's just one of the best things. So cute. And they're so like, just like little black fuzzballs with huge feet running behind their parents through the marsh. So um, we can go to the next slide. I'll talk about a story I have from monitoring at Buckhorn Island State Park. So this is a... Uh, Buckhorn Island is at the north end of Grand Island, which is kind of like right in the middle. It's a big island right in the middle of the Niagara River. And the north end of it is Niagara Falls, and the southern end of it is more towards Buffalo. And uh, we started this project last year, and it's we, we've been training volunteers. We, we have a pretty small staff at Buffalo Audubon. So we're training volunteers to help us with this project. And one woman who signed up was, was um, she's, she wouldn't call her herself a birder. This is just something that she saw us asking for help on Facebook and she decided it would be fun. So we, she went to our training. We went out to Buckhorn super early in the morning or sunrise. And you know, we, we have to walk out to the first point and the sun's coming up. And I always think to myself when I'm going out to these surveys that like, I've just never regretted seeing the sunrise. <laughs> like if you're never early enough to see this, it's just, it's never something that you look like, oh man, I wish I was in bed. Um, so we're out there super early and she's with me and, you know, talking about the birds we're going to see hopefully and, you know, talking this up. And so we go to our first point and we play the whole 11 minute tape and there's nothing. There's, there's lo loads of birds, but there's none of our marsh birds. Uh, we go to our second point. Again, there's just none of our target birds. Lots lots of rusty blackbirds and other things like that that we don't really see and you know trying to tell her here's a thousand rusty blackbirds but we hardly ever see them but that's cool to see all those and we get to our third point go to the next slide uh so at our third point this is, excuse the bad photo at our third point we start playing the tape and i can see like just the edge of the cat starting to move and i'm like it's gonna come out it's gonna the bird's gonna come right out in front of us you know, be, be ready so you can see it because it's probably going to run right back. So this Virginia rail starts walking out in the, the Virginia rail part of the tape. And it just keeps walking up to us and getting closer and closer. And it starts doing its grunt call. And it's, <laughs> you know, it's whole bodies into it. It's doing it. And I, and I take up my phone and I start recording. And I'm just like, wow, this is so amazing. And like telling her, like, you never see this. They never come out in the open where you can see them. And, you know, we're, we're so excited. She's got her phone out. We're taking pictures and video. And then it's, and then it kind of wanders back in and I'm like, oh no, <laughs> my phone is the, is the, the thing running this survey <laughs> connected to the Duke Bluetooth speaker that's playing the whole thing. So we had to like start over. We got so excited. We forgot, like, we're really here doing work. We had to start over, um, start the recording over, find the spot on the tape where we left off, go back to the Virginia Rail segment, start start playing. Again. Um, and, you know, throughout the – we only visit three times, but this Virginia Rail was there all three times. It was back again this year. We, I, we can't know it's the same one, but a new one, another one in the same spot was just great. Um, but just any time I see this bird, it's all I, – I feel like I could remember if I went through eBird, and looked on my checklist where I saw a Virginia rail. Like, I remember that. I remember that. I remember all of them. So it's just a great, memorable bird for me every time I see it. And I uh, always feel so lucky every time. I totally agree with you. I feel the exact same way. It's like we just are so lucky to be able to experience these birds that are so shy and secretive. And to come out in the open is a real treat. And I also want to say that your impression of the Virginia rail was, was a real treat as well. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. I'm glad you liked it. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. All right. So next we're going to be moving to um, Walter Marsis, who is going to provide some very important historical context for our marsh bird monitoring that Audubon has leading, been leading in the Calumet region of Illinois. Uh, Walter has been a Chicago area birder for over 55 years. And Walter is an active conservationist and currently monitors Calumet area marsh birds for us at Audubon Great Lakes. Walter, can you offer us some historical perspective of monitoring marsh birds in Calumet? Yes, I can. If you can hear me, I just turned off my mute. Can you hear me? 
We can, yes. Okay, great. Uh, first, I got to say I just loved hearing all the other stories. Just absolutely wonderful stuff. I don't uh, envy uh, Allison's encounter with the skunk, but uh, beyond that, it's all fun stuff. Um, I just want to say that, uh, yeah, I think the thing that sets me apart probably from the rest of the crew is that I'm a little older, and so I've uh, been, again, uh, in the Illinois Calumet area mainly, also in the, in the Indiana side, but mostly in the Illinois side, uh, birding in that area for over 50 years, as noted, and so I have been able to see a lot of the changes that have occurred, especially with marsh birds, and certainly there have been declines. So I'll just try to talk a little bit about some of that stuff. I do have to also uh, just comment on uh, Matt Beatty's discussion about uh, when he was uh, talking about the DuPont site in uh, East Chicago, and as he was glowingly talking about it, um, uh, so many people were asking, what's the name of the site? Can we go there? And, and Stephanie totally put a damper on it saying that, you know, uh, it's, uh, sorry, there's no access. But it is a, a fantastic site, and I feel very glad to be able to, to um, uh, survey there. And it's really uh, everything they say. I mean, it, it always continu continues to amaze. So anyway, getting back to history of the area. Now, uh, back in the 1980s, I started getting involved in uh, some of the uh, censusing projects. Uh, often these were conducted by, uh, uh, well, for instance, the, uh, what was called the Illinois Department of Natural Resources started the Illinois Breeding Bird Atlas. So I was in charge of the uh, uh, Calumet area in Illinois, and in conjunction with that, uh, uh, they did a number of, uh, uh, Chicago Audubon often did summer surveys. Anyway, uh, one of the things I became aware of very quickly was that uh, uh, there was a large breeding colony of uh, black crowned night herons at Big Marsh, which is roughly a 300-acre marsh site uh, in southeast Chicago. And uh, I became aware of the uh, Jim Landing, who got the results from US EPA surveys conducted by um, Sue Elston and her husband, John Ragnar. Uh, where they actually censused the nests of black crowned night herons at Big Marsh by walking. They would get a group of surveyors and they would walk through the, the marsh and then they would just count the nests and, and keep track of the number of young. And, and nests, young, eggs, whatever. Uh, well, they would come up with these extraordinary numbers, uh, hundreds of nests, sometimes 700 nests or more. This Again, this is in the 1980s. And, uh, it was remarkable to me because I would visit Big Marsh frequently, and the most I would ever see is maybe 10, 20, maybe 25 night herons. And uh, where were all these birds? And again, they were in the reeds, they were nesting. And just I just want to underscore how secretive these birds are. So you would never know they were there. Well, anyway. Uh, long story short, uh, a couple of friends of mine from Chicago Ornithological Society put our heads together. Uh, David Athens, Dennis Lane, and I uh, decided, well, uh, we can't find these night herons, but they must be there. The statistics, statistics prove it. Uh, but we knew that they were uh, nocturnal birds, crepuscular birds, so we thought, why not go out there maybe a half hour before sunset? and see what happens. So this was like uh, late April, uh, April 25th, 1991. We made a trip out to Big Marsh and we just sat there and watched what happens. And uh, as it turned out, yes, uh, as it got darker, the birds started flying out of the marsh and started heading toward their foraging areas. First you'd see a flock of five, then a flock of 10, then a flock of 20, then 25, then 30, and just over and over and until we realized there's just a ton of birds here. So we kept the count, and uh, we had to break it off at around 9 p.m., but we ended up with a total of 982 black crowned night herons. And as it turned out, 
later in that season, uh, Sue Elston did a survey, and they found 612 nests, so there was actually 1,200 birds. So, uh, again, it's just uh, amazing to me that uh, even a bird like a Virginia rail or a Sora, they can be in these marshes and you would never know it, but even you can have a thousand black card night herons right in front of you and you wouldn't know it. So secretive marsh birds is a correct term for this bird. That's it. Wow. Yeah, that's oh, incredible. I, I did miss, you had one I more? Did miss a, I missed a couple slides, didn't I? Okay, I'm sorry. Could you advance? Later that season, this was uh, June 1991, I did get an opportunity to walk into Big Marsh with the waders with a few people, and we did take some pictures of the nest, so you have a nest of babies and with uh, eggs. Uh, advance. I also did want to point out, uh, again, whoops, I think we're really advancing, yeah. Uh, uh, I just want to point out that there is no question that many of these birds are, are declining severely, and I, I, I think and I hope that we are starting to turn that around. But this is a scene taken by uh, uh, an elder friend of mine uh, from uh, back in the day, uh, Alfred Royce, uh, took this photo at the Calumet Cinder Flats, uh, which is the site of the Harborside Golf Course at Lake Calumet now. And so you see eight, eight yellow-headed blackbirds here. And now uh, there's essentially none uh, left, but they were quite a common sight, you know, just uh, uh, a matter of decades ago. And we would like to certainly turn that around. Okay, now I'm done. Thank you, Walter. Yes, I, I completely agree with you. I hope that someday we'll be able to go back to our Calumet wetlands and see lots of yellow-headed blackbirds and hundreds of black crown night herons. That must have been an incredible sight. Um, there was one question someone wanted to know in that other picture, if uh, the first slide, if it was sitting on a nest, the night heron. Pardon me? Was the night heron sitting on a nest in the first Yes, photo? oh yes, yeah. yes. And that was actually, um, that was taken at Heron Pond, which is another wetland close to Big Marsh. Uh, and that was the best picture I had, so I used that. Uh, usually the nests at Big Marsh were not visible, but uh, yeah. Definitely, that's, the, that, that's exactly what it was, black run iron in a nest. Great, thank you so much, Walter. Thanks for sharing mm -hmm. your stories. I think we could probably do a whole webinar just with your historic stories of, of Calumet. So we really One appreciate One of these it. days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we just have one last finalist that I, or finalist, final panelist. <laughs> that I will introduce. Um, Vera Leopold is with the Wetlands Initiative and she is the Grants Manager and Development Associate and also an avid birder. Since 2017, Vera has monitored marsh birds at Indian Ridge Marsh, the same location where we are seeing those night herons nest, um, which is on Chicago's southeast side. And um, that's part of our Calumet Marsh Bird Monitoring Program through Audubon Great Lakes. Uh, so Vera, can you tell us about how your work and with the Wetlands Initiative and how um, TWI or the Wetlands Initiative is uh, partnering with Audubon Great Lakes and the Park District to restore habitats at Indian Ridge Marsh? Definitely. Hi, everyone, and thanks for having me. Um, so we have, uh, like Stephanie said, we've been doing restoration at Indian Ridge Marsh with Audubon Great Lakes and with the Chicago Park District since 2016. And the Wetlands Initiative is really focused on on the ground wetland restoration. So we're focused on bringing wetland ecosystems back to places where they used to be, specifically in the Midwest and mostly in Illinois, to um, bring back all the really important natural services they provide, which wildlife habitat biodiversity is a huge part of that. So um, we started in 2016. Um, we're also Indian Ridge Marsh is the main area we're focusing in on the Chicago side of the Calumet region. There's some other sites like the West Branch, the Little Calumet River, and others that are mentioned in the Calumet in the Indiana region is really important. It has lots of important biodiverse sites as well. Um, and we have been basically since uh, 2016, we've been, TDY has been focused on the north end of Indian Ridge Marsh. And I should mention Indian Ridge Marsh is very close to Big Marsh and some of these other um, wetland sites, but it's all, they're all really in this kind of almost post-industrial, very urban industrialized landscape. There's been a lot of um, mills and factories there, some of which have been shuttered. 
there's a lot of debris left over from various in industrial operations. So it's a really kind of different restoration context than, than something that was not, you know, was not happening in an urban landscape. And so there's some interesting challenges there. But the amazing thing about these, these wetlands in the Calumet area is, you know, even because with all the changes, all the human development and alterations that have happened, you know, they were once part of this huge biodiverse wetland system. Now they're kind of down to these small parcels um, that are kind of divided and, and the hydrology and water patterns have been changed so much. But the, these marsh birds are still hanging on in, in small numbers in a lot of these sites. So it's really important that we get this restoration done. So how works we can improve the habitat for them? Because like Walter mentioned, there were these huge numbers and now because of all these changes, the changing water, water patterns, a lot of invasive species have moved in. We talked a little bit about, um, was talking about Phragmites before. That's definitely a huge challenge in Indian Ridge Marsh. Um, so we, we're doing a lot of Phragmites removal, um, a lot of planting to restore the native, um, native plant communities. And we're really focused on the Hemi Marsh, which is the habitat type that a lot of these wetland birds really rely on. And so that's been going well for the past few years. It's definitely an interesting and important challenge. And, um, we are now focused on, we're kind of moving into phase two of trying to deal with some of the hydrologic changes that have happened at Indian Ridge Marsh because there are really steep banks um, that it goes from kind of drops down from upland habitat straight into open water. A lot of especially marsh birds, but, but just all kinds of creatures want that more of a gradual transition between the habitats. So that's what our next step is at Indian Ridge Marsh. Oh, actually, yeah, I forgot to say. Next slide, thank you. Um, so this is Indian Ridge Marsh North. It's at 116th Street and Torrance Avenue is the intersection on the southeast side of Chicago. Um, you can see on the big right-hand picture, you can see actually that big hill back there is a landfill. There's a railroad track that runs along here. But you can see in the front, you know, this is a photo from when I was, I was marsh bird monitoring there early in the morning. And it's starting to look, it's starting to look a little pretty. Some of the native species are coming back. This is still early in the season. You can see on the left um, some of the de old debris and trash and things that if people had just kind of dumped at Indian Ridge Marsh over the years. So that was one of the first challenges was getting rid of these old tires and, and concrete and um, fridges and just things that people had dumped there when it was basically just closed off and, and nobody was doing anything with it. So we're also then, then that picture down at the bottom left, that's uh, Trevor Edmondson. I saw he's actually on the call tonight too. Um, our former restoration crew lead, lead at the Wetlands Initiative. He's on the right and then some folks from Audubon Great Lakes um, in the picture and they're working on planting some native plugs um, at Indian Ridge Marsh. So it's a really great partnership. We do volunteer events there. Um, before, before the whole pandemic happened, there were a lot of volunteer activities where people could go out and, and help um, help bring back the native plant communities um, hands-on. And that's really important for the surrounding communities to have access to this and be able to see these awesome wetland birds and all these other wildlife that will be benefiting from the restoration. Thanks for sharing that, Vera. And I hear you also have a marsh bird story for monitoring. Do you wanna share that story? I do. So this, uh, this is kind of brings it full circle with Walter's story from before of seeing the night herons. And I am really fortunate being a big birder that, um, that have working at the Wetlands Initiative, I had actually, before I worked for TWI, I had never been to the Calumet region for birding before. And I had always kind of heard about it. So the Calumet region on, on, uh, is kind of legendary to birders for the, as Walter talked about, the historical huge colonies of breeding marsh birds like the night heron. And there's a book that came out in the late 90s and that was just just the time, unfortunately, when the, the marsh bird populations were crashing in, in the Calumet region because of, because of all the habitat changes and alterations that had happened. And, um, but this book came out, Birding Illinois by Cheryl DeVore, and you know, it was all about this amazing breeding colony of night herons you could still see. And that was right in the Indian Ridge Marsh area. And so I had never been there. And so having the chance to do the marsh bird monitoring as part of the Auburn Great Lakes program at Indian Ridge Marsh since TDBI was working there was really exciting. And so I went out there and um, this picture on the right is one from my first day of monitoring. It was out with my backpack and clipboard and the, the um, playback uh, speaker. And I walked out to my, pulled up in the car, walked out to my first point about 5 a.m., 5.15 in the morning. 
and I start scanning around for, um, for the edge of the marsh to see what's out there. And the first species I see are these two black crowned night herons standing there. And I was so excited to see, you know, that even though, you know, we know they're not nesting there. Somebody mentioned there's actually a small number of them that are nesting up at Lincoln Park Zoo now that they've left the, the Calumet area mainly for breeding. And, um, but just to see them standing there, they're kind of foraging and you can see their posture in this photo, which, which Trevor, our uh, crew leader had taken, um, that they kind of have this, this hunchbacked posture. And they almost, to me, they almost look like cats, like standing at the edge of the marsh. So they're just really cool looking, dramatically plumaged birds. And they make that cool call that, that um, was played. And, um, you know, they're, they're really active at, at dusk and dawn. You don't really see them during the day. They, they kind of stay hidden. So just seeing those there is kind of the really hopeful, the hopeful sense of restoration that these birds are still around, at least in small numbers. They, they're still aware of the site. They're kind of keeping an eye on it, using it for foraging. And so the hope is as we all work together to restore sites like Indian Ridge Marsh and other sites in the Calumet that, you know, these birds will start coming back in good numbers and we'll be able to see that amazing spectacle that Walter saw again one day, um, if once the conditions are right as, as we work on bringing all these sites back to health. Thank you for those final words of inspiration. I, I do hope to see, well, every day I go out to Calumet, I'm always just blown away by what you can see out there and the progress that's been made. And I have high hopes for the future. So um, if you want to advance the next slide, I just want to, of course, thank you again, Vera, and thank you to all of our panelists today for contributing um, stories of marsh bird encounters. And if you of our audience have your own marsh bird encounter, you can tell us about it in the chat or post about it on social media. And if you'd like to become a marsh bird monitor yourself, we um, have some information that we'll share for you um, in the chat as well as in a follow-up email to this presentation. But um, for now, you can uh, email Erin Rowan at erin.rowan at audubon.org. And um, Erin can direct you no matter um, where, you, where you live, we can find the nearest area where they are recruiting marsh bird monitors. Um, of course, they're not serving everywhere, but we'll, we'll see how we can help you out there. Um, and then we also wanna remind you about some of the action steps that we talked about earlier in the present presentation. Um, remember to support the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, climate change and sustainable energy legislation, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, and find out about how you can become a local steward of your public lands and waters. So um, finally, we'll open it up to questions. I have a few questions that I've collected from the chat. Um, if you wanna enter your questions now, we'll also um, be answering questions with the group. Um, I'll read off a couple of questions that I've collected um, up until now. And um, so I have one, I would ask Walter, someone wanted to know how closely related are pied-billed grebes to other native grebe species? Do you have some bird taxonomy knowledge you can share with us? No. <laughs> uh, well, I'm not an, a taxonomist, so I, I wouldn't really have a definitive answer to that. I, I do know that they're in the genus Potolimbus. See, I knew which you would know I, something. Yeah, and which I think is, uh, there are no really close, uh, there are no other Potolimbus in our area. The other grebes we have are podiceps. So I think there are podolimbus limbus when you go down into maybe least grebe in Texas or middle America. So, so yeah, probably a little bit distantly related to the other grebes in our area, at least. All right. Thank you. Yeah, that, that makes sense. They look very different than um, they look, the, the bill shape is quite different from the other grebes. Yeah. Um, we'll ask Allison, there are some questions that came up about king rails and folks want to know how common they are. Do you, do you know uh, you, about that? You're asking me? Oh, um, I, uh, you, I was asking, I mean, oh, either of yeah, you. <laughs> yeah. Well, from my perspective, in the Great Lakes area, they're rare, period. And mm -hmm. as you get farther south, uh, they're, they're uh, 
Gulf Coast, you know, and so, southern uh, marshes in the southern uh, United States, uh, they're more, much more likely to be found. Uh, right now in the Great Lakes area, they're quite rare, but we hope to change that. Yes. Yeah, Allison, do you have anything to add to that with your... Yeah, absolutely. Um, king rails are listed as state endangered, and um, they've been of great interest to us just because there are just so few that breed in Indiana. Um, so if you ever do end up encountering a king rail, we're always interested in knowing about that, especially during the breeding season. Okay, so contact Allison if you see a king rail or your your local okay. DNR. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. One uh, question that I'll have Matt take if you're if you're with us, Matt. Um, someone wants to know more information about Phragmites and if it's taking over. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, um, Phragmites is definitely taking over. Definitely, at least at uh, this point. Um, I would say it's probably, at least in our, you know, the Calumet marshes that we're working on. Um, I, don't, I guess I don't want to say most, but one of our worst uh, wetland or wetland invasives that we are um, trying to treat and eradicate, or at least uh, manage. Yeah, Phragmites or common reed. It's very abundant in the Great Lakes region, and it's pretty much spread across all of our coasts, so it's definitely... But the good news, the, the good news is it is, uh, it is something that it, it's possible to manage it, and some of the pictures that I showed along the Grand Calumet River there um, were at one point, you know, covered in Phragmites, and we have successfully beat it back, and we've seen a lot of, uh, as long as you have consistent management, um, you can see it's really good results. Yes, yeah, your project has really given us hope that we can control Phragmites, even though sometimes the case is, looks a little dire. <clears throat> um, a follow-up question to Vera's um, discussion about the work happening at Indian Ridge. Um, do, you, I, do you know or do others, can others comment on whether there's been success reintroducing the native species you're talking about plant? Our plugs being planted. Do you do you know the yeah. answer to that? We uh, we started doing plant monitoring there. Um, kind of when we started the restoration in 2016, we got some baseline data on the plant species that were present, and we've been doing follow up. I think we do follow up plant monitoring at. Um, I'm gonna say it's 90 points. Maybe that's too many um, around the site um, where there's square meter plots, and then our ecologists list all the species found there. Of course, in the areas that were totally dominated by Phragmites, that was usually the only species. That there, were, there was maybe one other species of plant hanging on. So I don't have the numbers um, right now of what, what we had found two years later, and we'll be doing it again this year. But we did see substantial increases in, in native plants where we had, where we had planted. So we're seeing, we're seeing some success. It does take a while for those plants to establish in a place that was so altered, but they are, they are getting there. Hey, that's great news. We're getting there with getting rid of the Phragmites too. <laughs> awesome, photo, way like to go. One photo was all stands of Phragmites a few years ago. and You can actually see to the other bank now. <laughs> awesome. Um, one question uh, that came in was about least bitterns and we had those graphs of their populations, the trends diving down. Um, they, uh, the question wanted to know, or the, the person asking the question wanted to know um, why we think that the least bitterns populations seem to be recovering. And that's a really excellent question. We don't know entirely the answer to, but I've actually heard some rumors or <laughs> some, some ideas that people have had that they think that least bitterns are actually adapting to some invasive uh, vegetation like Phragmites and they're able to actually nest in plants like that. Um, we still don't know if that's true, but we're hoping that the data that we're collecting through this project, through our marsh bird monitoring, as well as collecting data on habitat, like for example with the, the drone surveys, that we'll be able to learn more about um, what these different species can tolerate and how they're adapting to even urban um, areas. So, um, 
Let's see, did, did I miss any other questions that came in in the chat? I don't think so, Stephanie. I think that was all the ones I sent your way. Oh, great. Thanks, Erin. All right, well, with that, we'll, we'll close the program for the evening. Thank you, everybody, so much for joining us. Thank you for, to our many, many panelists and speakers tonight. Um, we really enjoyed speaking to you about marsh birds of the Great Lakes, and we hope you enjoy the program. And um, as you see on the slide, we'd like to invite you to our next program, which is on backyard birding. So join us on June 15th. And if you'd like to learn more, check us out on Facebook and social me other social media pages. Our website is here on the screen here. So with that, thank you. Stay well and have a great night, everyone. Thank you.